Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the ALWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section, uh, section meeting on Zoom, uh, October 30th, uh, 2021. Uh, today we have a very exciting topic, it's a hot topic, and then we have the expert uh, distinguished speaker for this uh, uh, event. Uh, Dr. Henry Garrett is our ALWA fellow. And uh, you can see we have, uh, well, we, right now we're doing some introduction. Uh, then uh, in a few minutes, Dr. Garrett will start his presentation and uh, roughly one hour presentation at uh, 30 minutes Q&A. Uh, we'll try to be flexible. Well, before that, we have a few logistics to go over. Yeah, in the meantime, in, in, in meantime, we also wait for more people to sign in. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot to AIWA headquarters. Uh, they provided this very wonderful Zoom platform with all the loaded features and very supportive to our events. Um, the recording and uh, podcast will be posted after the event. Thanks a lot to our speaker today, Dr. Garrett, for his permission. Uh, if your bandwidth has any issue for the internet, you can use the phone dial-in uh, for the audio and just use the video for, for the, uh, to see the presentation. Uh, a few words about AIWA. AIWA is, uh, you can see the map, is a national organization. We also have international uh, region uh, and uh, member around the world. Our uh, president right now is Mr. Basio Hassan. Uh, Executive Director, Mr. Daniel Dumbacher. Uh, just a, a few words, actually, uh, Mr. Dumbacher was the former um, program manager for the NASA DCX, DCXA program. That's uh, uh, before SpaceX doing vertical launch landing. Um, and our section chair is Dr. Jeffrey Cushell, is AIW fellow, uh, Raytheon chief scientist. And the uh, AIW is here to support you, to encourage people uh, and motivate people for more aerospace. I apologize if any noise, it will be uh, briefly only. Um, LA has members around the world, headquartered in uh, Western Virginia. Join professional society give you uh, prestige and uh, connection networking opportunities. Uh, it's good for career education networking. Uh, right now we have a uh, different level of membership. Young professional, young professional is actually also professional member, but at early career. So they should have been called early career under 35 years old, but above college, they are not students. Uh, we have university student membership and high school membership. We are getting more and more high school members doing very good jobs. And right now 50% off for the early career professional. Um, once you become an member, you can immediately join AIW Engage to network with a member around the world and post information and uh, we have daily launch, give you insider story every day, and a monthly Aerospace America, uh, loaded with great articles. And uh, if you're a member, you enjoy great discount for going to AIW National Conference and Forum. The AIW also published ARC, and uh, we just received $1 million. Uh, I mean, our headquarters received $1 million for Blue Origin for Club of the Future, as mostly for education and the awards and the industry guy. And uh, it's good for your seeking career, whether it's early or any stage of your life. And a uh, very important feature for AWR is you can advance your ranking, uh, your membership. Uh, you join a member, then after years, you become senior member. Uh, then uh, you can uh, get nominated to become an associate fellow, then a uh, fellow like today, our uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Garrett is uh, uh, AWR fellow, and also our uh, uh, long-term long former uh, section chair, Dr. James Wurz, president of Microcosm, and uh, of course, Dr. Jeff Rochelle, section chair, and many others, including uh, Mr. Steve Izakovich, uh, president of Aerospace Corporation. Then you can uh, also advance to honorary fellow, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill, Dr. Bill Gerstenmeier and uh, Dr. Mark Ruiz, and uh, Mark Aldrin is also our <clears throat> honorary fellow, and Ms. Green Shotwell, and, and more. Uh, we have awards at Guggenheim, Reed, all, all kind of Bonkama, many other, it's very encouraging and inspiring. Student membership, you can attend the uh, uh, regional student paper conference, design, build and fly contest, 
and they can apply scholarships. Uh, you have to be a student member to apply the scholarship, the other scholarship. One big event coming up is in, uh, next month in two weeks. Actually, virtual events started, uh, will start around uh, November 8, 8 to 10. You can see on the right, that's online. And uh, if you would like to go to Las Vegas in person, that's 15 to 17. It's a great event uh, to build your uh, space ecosystem and the career. We also have national webinar and the courses, very, very good uh, courses. Uh, five national forums and uh, local Southern California, as you know, is uh, blessed with long history of aerospace and uh, many companies did wonderful job um, uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, it's a vibrant community and it's uh, developing very fast. And, uh, and new new incomers and uh, uh, like uh, relativity space, launcher space, uh, you know, Ampere for electric hybrid aircraft and for many other great companies. Uh, we keep doing the events uh, to keep everybody networking together and get informed for what's going on um, in, the, in the industry and aerospace. Uh, so after today, uh, on Monday in Las Vegas, we have this, uh, 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 the son of the famous uh, pilot, Francis Gary Powers, his son is going to give a talk in Las Vegas. He actually gave a talk last year to talk about his father's uh, uh, experience and uh, that uh, the event shocked the world during the Cold War. And uh, November 6th, we have a space war event. And uh, we have newsletter. This is October, so you, you are welcome to uh, contribute your article or recommend articles. Uh, and uh, it's a great opportunity to let people know about you and what you are, you are doing and the network together. Okay, so we have post a video on YouTube, we have podcasts on Apple, Google, and many places. So today our distinguished speaker, Dr. Henry uh, B. Garrett, is a fellow, is a principal scientist. Uh, it's been long years of, you know, very, uh, inspiring experience in the Office of Safety and Mission Success, and also previously in Air Force uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Caltech. He got a, a doctoral degree in space physics and astronomy. He has over 150 publications on the space environment and its effects with specific emphasis in the areas of atmospheric physics, the low Earth iron sphere, radiation, micrometeoroids, space plasma environments, and the effects on materials and system in space. While on active duty in the Air Force, he served as project scientist for the highly successful uh, SCATA program, which studied the effects of charging on spacecraft. For this, he was awarded the Harold Brown Award, the Air Force highest scientific award. In 1992, he was selected for a joint DOD NASA assignment at the Pentagon as part of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, where he acted as the deputy program manager for the Clementine Lunar Mission and the program manager for the Clementine Interstage Adapter Satellite, ISAS. For contribution to these missions, he was awarded NASA's Medal for Exceptional Engineering Achievement. After 30 years career in the US Air Force Reserves, he retired in 2002 as full colonel and was awarded the uh, Air Force Legion of Merit. During his 40 years career at JPL, he has been responsible for defining the space environment and its effect on reality for many NASA missions. He has also published several textbooks on the space environment and uh, its impact on spacecraft design and the reliability. Dr. Garrett is an international consultant on terrestrial and interplanetary space environments and the space spacecraft reliability Having worked for Intelsat, LaGuardia, NASA, Laurel, CNES, and other organizations. In 2006, uh, Dr. Garrett received NASA's Exceptional Service Medal for his achievements in advancing the understanding of space environments and effects. Recently, Dr. Garrett co authored with Mr. Albert uh, Whittlesey, the primary NASA standard on spacecraft service and internal charging for Earth missions. Dr. Gary retired from full-time duty at JPL in 2017, but continues in an emeritus position. He was made a fellow 
uh, of AIWA in 2019. So uh, let's highly heartily welcome Dr. Henry Gass for a great uh, uh, today's uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Garrett. Okay, thank you. So should I go ahead and start sharing my screen? Yes, please. Okay. And let's see if that works. Okay, does that look okay? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> yeah, looks just fine. Okay. I think the one thing I would like to add to, to uh, Ken's wonderful reading of my uh, resume is that I was raised in a small Air Force base in New Mexico at Walker Air Force Base. I grew up, I was, I was born about nine months after a landing near Roswell and uh, I grew up there for 20 years. And at no time did I realize that uh, we had a UFO landing there till I was in like my thirties. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my background is, shall we say a little bit related to space because Roswell was the home of Robert H. Goddard and it was the first formal spaceport. And you go downtown in the evenings and you go to the museum. And I highly recommend if you're ever in Roswell, don't go to the UFO museum, go to the Roswell museum and you can see wonderful displays of the first rockets. Uh, my talk today is going to be on things that make holes in your spacecraft and can destroy it, namely uh, micrometeoroids and space debris. Uh, I don't know if I've dated myself, but the cartoon on the left is Sanford and Son from the 70s. They were uh, very famous junkyard owners on TV. On the right, showing the shuttle is actually more realistic than you realize. Uh, I'll start out by telling you that yes, they did flush the commode overboard on the shuttle and they photographed it and it would make beautiful comet tails of all the debris coming out and the debris that came out would come back and hit the shuttle. And they would have shuttle tiles that had holes in them from the um, uh, frozen ice and such that would come out. So space debris is not anything new to our community. It's been there since Ed White's glove went uh, uh, missing on one of the early flights for the first EVAs. And basically space debris and micrometeoroids have been causing concern for the entire period of our space program. Now today, I'm going, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the environments, talk about the effects of those environments, and then talk about some of the mitigation techniques and shielding techniques that we have to protect from space debris and from micrometeoroids. One of the big problems that we've had over the past uh, decades is the fact that micrometeoroids or space debris uh, even small sizes down for a few millimeters or so can cause major damage to solar arrays, for example. Here you can see examples of where micrometeoroids impacted uh, uh, near a solar array panel, caused a plasma cloud that then shorted out the array elements. And you can see where the, what the shorting did. On, the, on this one on the left is on the ISS. On the right, the same thing happened on the Sentinel-1A satellite. Um, I, as you'll see later, I was fortunate enough to get a uh, work on a WIFTIC-2 from the Hubble Space Telescope camera that JPL launched. And when they brought it back, I was allowed to crawl all over that. And ultimately, NASA found over 600 pits in about a one by two meter square area on that after about 10 to 15 years in orbit and just hundreds and hundreds of little pits as we'll see from the impacts. So there are lots of different things that can happen with spacecraft uh, being impacted by micrometeoroids and debris. I'd now like to describe first off the environments that lead to these. On the left is the, where we can see the particles. You'll notice that around one centimeter to 10 centimeters is sort of the uh, uh, sweet spot from detecting uh, space debris. And on the, you can see uh, basically smaller than that, we have to retrieve actual samples like from the Hubble or from the STS and uh, other spacecraft as we'll see as we go through here. And we then can analyze the actual pits, but those are small pits. 
basically above about one centimeter in size. It can lead, as we'll see in a little bit, total destruction of your satellite. So you've got below one centimeter, we can kind of protect against it. Above one centimeter, it's pretty bad. It uh, basically ruins your whole day. And so my, most of my talk will be concentrating below one centimeter because it's something we can do something about. On the right is the micrometeoroid environments, similar plot to the left showing where all the different uh, data sources are for the measurements. Again, uh, this is an in interplanetary space, but at 1 AU, basically. The zodiacal lights, you can see them when the sun sets if you get out on a very clear night in the desert. And those are um, micron to tens of micron sized particles, dust particles that are falling into the sun. And they form in the ecliptic. And th they give a good record of the uh, environment for that number of particles. Then at 1AU, of course, we have radar measurements. And as you can see down there, inter we can measure the interplanetary flux at the Earth. And from micro, as you'll see from meteoroid streams and things like that. And we can measure the asteroids and such out there. Galileo and Ulysses are a couple of the spacecraft that me have measured the uh, space environment on the way out and give us ideas about the micrometeoroids. I myself, with the uh, uh, joint uh, Star Wars uh, NASA mission, Clementine, uh, measured the, uh, and with, uh, with uh, this rock Air Force Research Labs in Albuquerque, we measured, I flew their instrument, we measured the 10 micron uh, uh, size flux particles between here and the moon. But Clementine went to the moon and we dropped the dust detector off. And so we do have measurements out to the moon uh, in situ. And that was about one to two hits a day um, in uh, half lunar orbit. So that gives you some idea where the data comes from, primarily from radar observations. You can see the meteors coming in that uh, helps us detect the meteor streams and things of that nature. So uh, space debris, radar primarily, um, impacts on spacecraft and uh, zodiacal light measurements primarily for the meteoroids as shown here, or telescopic observation of the asteroids. Now this is, this is data from the space debris itself. Up on the left there, if you go to that site, you can actually see a movie in real time showing the, the uh, current, which is shown here, and the projected uh, debris environment that it moves and you can rotate it in three dimensions. And if you look on here, I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see my marker, I guess, oh, there it is. Uh, this is for a thing called the Molnaya type orbit. The Russians like to orbit in this because it, it puts, at, when they're at uh, Apogee, they can hang out there and see Russia and, and, trans, and uh, do their communication satellites. This is GEO out here. This is LEO and that's shown over here also. And typically, we, we, although it says we can measure down to one millimeter, I mean, uh, one centimeter, we typically ten, five to 10 centimeters up is all we can really measure directly with radar in low Earth orbit. Down here gives you some idea of where things come from. Uh, the payloads themselves leave behind debris, the fragmentation debris from satellites running in each other, things flaking off like the paint and stuff. And down here we have the operational debris. Uh, this is uh, things like, uh, um, parts of the shroud, stuff like that, that come off and are left in orbit. And finally, one of the most interesting ones is the rocket bodies, you know, like the second or third stages are left in orbit often. Uh, I must, as I'll show you a little later, the uh, Clementine mission, the Titan II that we launched was supposed to vent proper, it was supposed to be vented, it wasn't, and it exploded and made a, a bump in the uh, natural debris environment soon after our mission launched, I'll show you that. Uh, this is an idea of what the space debris looks like in distributions. You can see on the left up, upper left up here, if you were, were a fly flying along in a satellite orbit, you'd see out to the right of you and to the left of you, parallel to the Earth's surface, you'd see these two regions. Um, th this is basically the plane, that you, the plane parallel to the Earth that you're traveling in. This is your uh, pitch angle. This would be overhead. This would be under you. 
this would be back over here would be the rear. So basically at about 30 to 40 degrees uh, left and right is where most of the space debris is coming from because you're running into it. Most of what you're gonna hit is in your orbital plane and most of it is you're gonna be over, you're gonna be basically overtaking it. it was like, it was over here on the right is the latitude distributions. This is stuff launched from Kennedy and um, uh, spaces and other at 30 degrees. Up here is the Monia type orbits. These are sun synchronous orbits over here, the latitude distribution. And so this gives you some idea of at least of the inclination distribution of the space debris and as a function of altitude. Down here's the function of altitude um, out to about 10 Earth radius, a little bit less than 10 Earth radiuses. And you can see these peaks, this is LEO. Notice that the LEO falls off, of course, this is because of atmospheric drag brings this stuff in. But much above about 500 to 600 kilometers, as we'll see a little later, the stuff never comes down. You're, it's pretty much there permanently. Then you have the MEO orbits, GPS, things like that. And you get out here uh, towards uh, the, uh, uh, outer orbit geo, I think, is out. Geo is about here because that's altitude, and so that's geosynchronous orbit. And then it falls off, of course, as you as you go out towards the moon. So that's the distribution and altitude. Now this is this is the famous uh, Don Kessler syndrome. Um, I actually in my first AIAA book, uh, Don uh, published his original paper there, uh, reprint of it, uh, describing the Kessler syndrome. Basically, this is, the, this is the current distribution at LEO. You can see MEO and GEO and, and super GEO and stuff like that. But right about here is where my Clementine Titan II blew up. Right here is where the uh, Chinese did an anti-satellite test. Right here is this uh, Iridium Cosmos. This is the first uh, well-documented uh, collision between two satellites. And that occurred about 2008. Now, what Don did back in the 70s, uh, uh, mid 70s, is he did a study of the satellites in orbit and did various projections of how many of those satellites we would have with time and calculated the, the likelihood of collisions. This is about where we are right now. And in fact, in 20, as you can see, we had our first one right about in here, the first collision between two satellites right in here. What he's plotting here is the probability of a collision of two satellites given certain growth rates. And the problem is that once you get two running into each other, they create a whole bunch of secondary payloads, uh, debris clouds. And those debris clouds can run into other satellites and you get what's basically an exponential growth rate in the creation of space debris. And that's the, called the Kessler syndrome. And you can, so you can, so right, so we're right about in here. And you can see over here, there have been some bad incidents in the past. So that's the, basically the space debris environment and describes the, 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 the critical Kessler syndrome. This is the thing the world is very concerned about is because it's entirely possible that within a, uh, within a generation, we may have a very hard time flying anything at uh, LEO and as with these mega constellations that are going up from uh, uh, the different uh, providers that you can imagine what's gonna happen. Some of them are 10 to 20,000 satellites for these. Now, this is the ambient environment. This is the micrometeor, this is the meteoroids. And these are actual samples I have. They're about the size you see here actually. Uh, the most basic one we normally think of are the iron meteorites. This is pure, uh, pure iron nickel. And if you take and cut it open and etch it with acid, you'll see this crystalline pattern. In fact, basically what happened is the iron, as it condensed, formed crystals. And these are called woodman stoughton patterns. And you can tell which, which asteroid basically these things came from by looking at the, the, the unique pattern in the crystalline uh, structure of the iron meteorite. Now, if you think of that as the middle of the planet, as you move out from the planet or from the small, from the asteroid, you run into a region where the uh, 
heat from the heat of the, the core melts the iron, but at the same time melts the dirt. And so you get glass-like structures. This is called a palisite. These are some of the most valuable of the meteors rights that you can recover. So you're actually seeing through it. This is glass, it's melted glass mixed with the iron. Over here, you're now you're getting to the regions mostly rock, but you can see the micro, you can see the metal uh, inclusions in it over here. Ultimately, you get to the surface and you can get uh, chondrites, uh, these little nodules, chondrules in here that you can see. And this is a stony meteorite. And these are basically, if you want to think of it that way, is the surface of the planet. So you go from the core, you go to the in-between region, then you slowly fade out of the metal and then you get up to stones. So that's what the environment looks like uh, for the uh, micrometeoroids. And of course, lots of water, lots of ice, uh, from comets, things of that nature. Comets, of course, can be largely ice dust co combinations as we found. Now, to make it cl clear to you, you've all heard of the Chevrolet uh, meteor shower, a uh, uh, big meteor that came in and crashed over uh, Russia. We see them all the time around the earth. This one is from the uh, near Chicago, the Park Forest meteor impact and actually hit some poor guy's car and uh, if it had come down totally intact as one piece, whoops, it would have been about a, a 0.4 to 6.6 .6 kiloton explosion in that region. So that the, to give you, this is the impact pattern uh, from all the pieces of the thing that came down that, that they were able to collect near uh, Chicago. This is what's really frightening. Um, this is a typical, uh, so uh, a picture of the worldwide kiloton events observed between 1998 and 2002. You can now get these pretty much in re uh, real time uh, from various sites if you know where to look. And just to emphasize what you're seeing here, you're seeing a kiloton explosion or higher. In other words, on the order of, of an atomic bomb going off on the earth in the, in the period of just four years here. That at the time, uh, they were very worried of the um, w w in the Iraqi war that we would get one of these things over Israel, and Israel would think it was Iraq trying to uh, do a nuclear attack. So it can be quite serious, as you saw from the thing that happened in Russia, the the Chevrolet when uh, hurt lots of uh, several hundred people were hurt or cut by glass and by falling. Uh, objects. This is a similar thing for the, uh, to the space debris for what you would see if you're looking out uh, in orbit from the Earth, uh, or as it says on the left over there, it, virtually anywhere in the solar system. Uh, if you look towards the sun, you'll see the uh, no, you'll see stuff coming uh, up. up and down from the south, you'll see stuff coming in the north and, and southern uh, polar regions. And then you'll see things in the direction you're moving and the direction you're coming from. And so this gives you sort of, again, a pitch and yaw type view of the meteoroid environment that you're liable to see. Now, this is an idea of the amount of fluence that you get. That is the number of per square meter in at one AU for a year. And Basically what you would do here is you would multiply the area of your spacecraft uh, by this number, and that would tell you how many particles of that type that you would get hit by. So you can see for like a um, one, uh, say a one meter spacecraft, the typical size particle you get hit, it would be about one uh, microgram particle per year. And then as you move down, you can see it gets less and less and less. But as you go to smaller sizes, if you, if you approach the uh, uh, tens of micron sizes, you're starting to get three or four a year or more. And down here, of course, if we get, you're getting up to 100 kilograms, 100 grams and higher, uh, it drops off dramatically. But this, gives, this is a quick and dirty at one AU uh, estimate of how many impacts you'll get from micrometeoroids. This is the other issue. Uh, that is that there are meteor streams. Uh, I think the most, uh, the, the Leonids down here, uh, when sometimes can get uh, up to thousands in, in a few hours. And as 
if you remember. And you can see these are all the different streams. This is the month in which they're active. This is the maximum number you should see per hour. And you can get a feel for the uh, amount of flux. You can see some of them are very short, just one or two days, like the quaternions up here. The Perseids are very uh, well known one, and they can reach up to five or more per hour. And these things change with time. Like I say, the Leonids down here can be huge. Every 80 or something years, they can get to, they have a big spike in them. So this is the other background that you have to concern yourself with are the meteor streams. At JPL, if we know where we're, we know our orbit in advance, we will actually in some cases try to steer away from the meteor streams. Uh, for example, what Mar Mariner 4 was apparently, we've never been able to definitively prove it. We believe it was flew through a meteor stream uh, near Mars and had one of its batteries punctured. So meteor streams are not good, and but we know vaguely where they are. We know the orbits and we can steer through them and we do actually. The Leonids, for example, when the, the big one came back about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, satellites were deliberately oriented different ways and things of that nature. Recently, when a comet went by Mars, uh, we turned some of our uh, satellites so that they would get minimum impacts. And they saw them, uh, not on the satellites, but on the surface. Now, this is a composite plot showing you basically the uh, size of the particles that, are do that dominate the below uh, one centimeter range, that's mainly meteoroids. Above one centimeter, you're dominated by space debris. This is at the Earth, of course. And this gives you a feel uh, as, uh, for what the total uh, number per square meter per year is for the uh, ambient and for the uh, man-made environments. So this is a nice handy chart if you're interested in this type of thing. Now, let's look at what we do to try to limit some of these things. One of the classic examples of shielding for uh, meteor rise and space debris is called a Whipple shield. Uh, the idea is like with tanks, you have, a very th you have a thin outer shield that breaks up the particle and causes it to break into thousands of little pieces or to liquefy it. And then those hit the surface farther back uh, where the cloud is expanded. I'll show you some movies of that in just a second. But I call your attention to this. This is from, I think it was Solar Max mission, one of the panel, one of the uh, cool, uh, 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 panels that was used to cool. They'd have louvers and louvers would open and, and then close to expose the surface behind that that would reflect the heat or not. This is the front surface, one, one of the louvers. It's a, this scale here, notice, is 100 microns. That's the original particle. Then behind that, when they looked, they, and the louver was hit, made this hole, and then this is a factor of 10 larger. Uh, you can see while well, it broke it into thousands of little pieces, and then they hit the back surface. And basically, uh, this is the way a Whipple shield works. You break up the particle into thousands of little pieces. They're spread out, they expand of one over R squared from the distance between the two surfaces. And you, can, you do a lot less damage in principle. Now, I want to call your attention to one sad fact about this. If you're trying to make a redundant system so that if the meteor comes in or the debris comes in and breaks your circuit, what you don't want to do is make the redundant circuit right next to it. And this is a mistake that has been made. In other words, you want to put the, the redundant circuits far away so that one meteor or debris hit will not take out your entire circuit. So that's one basic law of meteoroid and debris protections. Don't put your circuits together because of the uh, secondary debris. Now, we're, now what we're going to do is to go into a look at the various types of failures. The basic and bottom line of all this is you really got to figure out what you're from your design engineers, what they're worried about being hit by a meteor or debris. For example, if you got an electric propulsion system, you're primarily concerned about your xenon tank breach. And because that's typically the largest area. And if it leaks, then you've lost your fuel. Uh, for a space module, it might be a damaged internal electronics or in the case of astronauts in the ISS, leak out the air. 
Uh, another large, another big problem area is radiators. Heat radiators often will be, have a coolant loop. And if you break one of the, the uh, uh, plumbing, you're gonna leak out the, the loop, the, the material. In fact, one of the mo most common sources of radiation in low earth orbit these days is the old Russian reactors. Uh, they, they used liquid lithium, if I remember, to cool them. And they penetrated the some of the they cracked or their lines were penetrated and they they literally leave a trail of radioactive lithium and it messes up gamma ray measurements and stuff like that around the earth. Uh, the LDEF uh, mission, which was up for like five or six years, when they brought it back to study all the surfaces and, and the active measurements, they were able to trace a whole bunch of these uh, streams that the Russian satellites were leaking in space of the uh, debris. So over here are some examples. We'll look at this one in more detail. This is the, basically what happens is the particle came in this way. It hit, as you can imagine, particle, uh, it broke up and scattered, scattered debris back this way. But as it came in, it sent out a shock wave and that shock wave hit this surface here and reflected. As it reflects, it, the, you have material going this way and you have material going that way. And so you get what's called a spall broken off. You've seen glass. If you shoot glass with a BB gun, you'll notice that you have a little hole on one side and the other side you have what looks like a funnel. That's the spall. That's because the shock wave hit the back surface, reflected and the front, the, the back surface continued to move outwards and the reflected wave went this way and you tear off a chunk of material. And again, that's one of the problems with shielding of any type. Now, this is my pictures that I took of the Whitefield Planetary Camera. It's now at the Smithsonian and in the main museum. And if you go there and look, you will see this, but you will see little circles where every one of these things are. They're, like I said, there are about 600 of them. They cord the samples. Uh, each one of the little craters and they have a, basically a library of craters. But this is about the right size. This is what it looks like. There's a little pinprick right here. That's the space debris in this case that came in, hit, hit the surface, created a crater, and then a shock wave went out from it. And the shock wave broke the, the uh, uh, paint on the surface. And then after some time uh, the from thermal stresses and things like that, the paint comes off. Uh, on a lot of these little pits along here, you won't, you can see just the little pin prick and you'll see a brown circle around it. And that brown circle will eventually, if, if the thermal stress, it'll break off or crack off and you'll be left with a, with a hole like this. And this is about the right size. So bottom line is you have to think about what you're going to have. You're gonna have cratering such as shown here or you're gonna have perforation. And perforation is a specific definition. In other words, we, we want to know what the minimum size particle and the maximum size shield that you can, it takes to, to prevent perforation. Perforation is where the small uh, crater and the crater from the front just touch like an hourglass. And so that air or whatever liquid or something can get out. So that's our definition of perforation. And, the, and like I say, the difference is cratering is just on the surface. It's like you have an infinite surface behind it. So let's go look at some of these. This is going to be the most technical part of the talk. And I'm sorry if it uh, gets, a, gets a little tedious here, but these are actual measurements by Burton Kerpelet from NASA Johnson. And along here, you have the velocity. I call your attention to the fact that typically uh, orbital velocities for space debris range from about eight kilometers per second down at LEO to um, three kilometers per second at GEO. And the problem, problem is that to duplicate large particles, anything above about one uh, milligram or so, we use guns and the, they're big guns, they're big 20, 30 foot long barrels and they use gas uh, chambers to uh, propel them. And when you fire those guns at those velocities, anything above about 10 kilometers per second, you tend to melt the barrel. And so every time you fire a shot, you have to go and you have to remake the gun 
So it's very expensive. So we typically don't go much over about six, six to 10 kilometers per second in test, which fortunately is what it is for most uh, space debris. Anyway, uh, that aside, this is the diameter of the crater divided by the diameter of the impacting uh, material uh, mass, in this case, uh, uh, micrometeoroid perhaps. And so you can see that basically a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is the, uh, this gives you the uh, depth of the depth of the, the size of the crater right here. The scale is the size of the crater and it's proportional to D over D. And this down here is the velocity. So if you plot this, you find that the uh, diameter of the crater to the diameter of the mass uh, is the diameter of the crater over the, the, the diameter of the, of the impacting particle goes roughly as one half mv squared over a constant to the one third power. I'm gonna show you how that's derived in just a second. That's basically the physics and I'll show you the physics. This, this is the actual measured curve right down here. And you can see that again, it's, you get the v to the two thirds, you get the uh, diameter, pro, the diameter of the crater to the diameter of the impacting particle is one roughly one to one, and then you have uh, that the the uh, density is around uh, half here, around a third up here. But so let's see where that formula comes from. This will give you an idea of the physics of the situation. Here you calculate the energy of the incoming meteoroid or debris particle. That's equal to four thirds pi r cubed, in this case, the diameter instead of r, so you have to divide by two, times uh, one half mv squared. This is the mass times, the, the, I'm sorry, this is the volume times the density. So this part of the equation is the mass, and this part of the equation is the v squared over two. So e equals one half mv squared. And that's, the energy of the incoming particle. Now we're going to assume empirically that for a crater, as shown here for a shuttle, this was a shuttle pit of about four millimeters across that from one of the, from one of the shuttle uh, main uh, windows, they had to replace it after this impact, obviously, um, that the crater, the crater mass is roughly half of a sphere. So the mass of the crater is proportional to the impact energy, the meteoroid, and some kind of constant of the material. Uh, as shown here, we're making, this is the assumption we're making, is that there's a constant related to the density of the material. This is proportional to the heat of the fusion. But anyway, the mass of the crater is equal to one half four thirds pi r cubed times the uh, density. So that's the mass. And we're going to assume that's related to the energy the incoming particle over this constant times the density. If you look up here, you can replace all the, uh, all this stuff. You can end up replacing it um, with the incoming energy. Okay, so you come out with that the mass of the crater is is proportional to this quantity, i.e., the kinetic energy coming in divided by the heat the uh, heat of fusion of the material times the density of the crater material. And if you solve for that, if you put this in here and you solve for that, you come out with it that the crater, the depth, of the diameter of the crater is equal to E naught to the minus one third times the depth, the diameter of the incoming particle one half, rho V squared to the one third which is the particle, which is the equation we got over here. So that's basically the physics. You're making a simple assumption that the amount of energy coming in is proportional to the amount of material that's uh, kicked out. Now it gets more, much more complicated when you go to different configurations. That's for a crater with an infinite wall behind it. And that would be what I was, like I was showing you for the uh, uh, wide field planetary camera surface. There's basically two, two issues. One is if the part, incoming particle is big enough and the shield is thin enough, this is going to do a cookie cutter. Just come right through, punch through, and what you got coming in is going to be slowed a little bit by the, whatever mass that you've added to it as it goes through. So it's just momentum conservation. However, if we have perforation, the shock waves kind of come down here, it's going to go back this way. 
and we're going to knock out a spall. And so this distance is what we're concerned about. We want this just to touch. We want to know what the thinnest shield that we can design for the particle most likely to, to cause damage to our spacecraft. And I'm not going to go for how these are derived. I'm just going to show you that similarly, there's physics that went into this to calculate this equation. And down here, this is the actual uh, measure uh, for a given configuration. The issue here turns out to be that the uh, material properties become very significant. And like uh, radiation shielding and things like that, you have to go to three dimensions. You have to go to track, track the shock wave and things like that. And uh, when I was working with AFRL, we used some of their programs to actually calculate the, uh, um, the, this, the detail in here and debris that would come off and all that stuff. So it gets much more complicated, but the bottom line is T critical is the thinnest shield that we can have so that the uh, whole, that the spall coming off the back just touches the crater created in the front. And that would be the, the shield thickness at which the shield basically fails. And that's the picture over here. You come in this way, off goes the spall. You got garbage going this way and garbage going this way. But notice that the garbage tends to expand as one over R squared out this way. Now here, this is what I'm showing. You can see there it penetrated. That's the one over R squared over here. It's about seven kilometers per second. This is the Whipple shield. Particle moves out here. And then hopefully this shield back here is thick enough to stop the spread. But notice what happens. The, uh, in principle, what we're hoping is that this is now, instead of being this big, is over this area. So, so it's spread out and the pressure front is a lot reduced. In this particular case, it failed the second shield too. But at least you get, you get the idea. You want to break up the particle here. You want it to expand as one over R squared here. And so this distance S is very critical. And the thickness of the front shield and the back shield uh, added together give you the mass protection for the, your satellite. And that's actually what we, the way we calculate it. We add up the, the shield thickness that's in the spacing. We have to space them apart. That's what they did on the space station. They actually have standoff shields over the crew compartments and critical air, uh, other areas as we'll see in just a second. So this is then the new formula we have to deal with. This is T critical, uh, the thickness of the front for the bumper. It has to be, and then this is the spacing. We're assuming that things fall off as one over S squared. And this is the momentum of the incoming particle. So to first order, this is the uh, optimum range of the uh, of spacing and the critical shielding thickness for the particle. Now down here, the, this is much more complicated for something we call the non-optimum range. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. Here's the, here's the cute feature about uh, Whipple shields. If the thickness of the shield is big, much larger than the incoming particle, the particle is gonna be clearly melted. It's gonna be basically turned to a gas if you're really lucky. And that's this region up here. This is the impact velocity down here. So if it goes, the faster you go, the more it's melted. Now, on the other hand, however, if the shield is too thin, the aluminum will, the shield will melt, for example, but it won't, the projectile won't. If, in other words, if the projectile is too big, D is too big compared to T, S, then you're, you're hosed because the uh, particles, got, the shield is going to break up and it's going to just add to the mess of the uh, uh, projectile coming in. So there's an optimum region here where both the shield and the projectile melt. You really don't want to be in these two regions. Uh, but you can't help it all the time, but that's what it is. Now, this is a single wall shield. All, these are all the same thickness. The shield was designed with was uh, single thickness. And what you have here is the uh, vo incoming velocity is over here. And you can see that for a 20 kilometer per second particle coming in, you can protect basically with a single wall somewhere between uh, 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus fifth grams. 
However, if you go to a properly designed Whipple shield, you get almost five orders of improvement in the shielding and the non-optimum is, is not as quite as good. So you, you get the idea. A Whipple shield breaks the particle up, spreads it out, and you can get uh, orders of magnitude improvement for the same shielding mass. It, it, you, you basically break the shield up into a thin outer shield and then a, a wall in the back to catch the debris. And, but they have the same shield thickness as a single wall. So now let's go back and let's take a quick look at why I said one gram-ish particle or one uh, cubic centimeter particle is sort of not a good idea. This is a one gram particle shot at an actual satellite at about six to seven kilometers per second. And this is after, oops, again, before, after, not much left. <laughs> this is Bill Cook at Marshall. Marshall typically handles the micrometeoroid and meteoroid environment, meteor and, and environments for NASA. JSC, uh, uh, Mark Matney and company, basically handle all the the uh, space debris work. Though they overlap, and we at JPL are a primary user of their estimates for all of our satellites. Uh, nowadays, NASA requires that you have certain. Uh, certain probabilities of, of being impacted, you need to reduce your uh, satellite below those points. And I'll show you those in a little bit. You have to alter the orbit, the end of mission and things like that. Now, this is gonna be complicated, but I'm gonna to try to simplify it. And this is the last of the complications that we're going to talk about today. And uh, we're getting towards the end of our time anyway. The key step in micrometeoroid and space debris design is to determine what your critical mass is that will cause your satellite to fail. This is the, that's this equation right here. That's the incoming velocity the a, and the angle, the two different angles that you're gonna impact on. You, you want to know the critical mass as a function of velocity and impact angle. For a mission trajectory, you're gonna determine the total, this is the flux now along the orbit in terms of mass, velocity, angle, and time. This is the number of particles per square centimeter per second per stair radian that are going to hit you of a given mass. So two things you need, you need the critical mass and then you need the mass distribution as a function of velocity and time. But what we do then is fairly straightforward in a, in a conceptual sense. We integrate that quantity from the critical mass, obviously if it's below the critical mass, you don't care about it, to infinity. And as a function of angle and a, a velocity, that gives you the critical flux as a fu function of time. So number of particles per square centimeter uh, that are going to fail your system. That's what you want. That's the quantity that you need to know. Then what you do is you integrate over time to get the total fluence. Fluence is flux times time. So that's the total number of particles that will fail your system. That's the key number. Now, given that, and we, I'll show you the types of, pro we have lots of programs that do that nowadays, and I'll describe those a little later uh, where you can get the computer programs. Uh, we make the following assumption. Because you, you, you're not getting hit every few minutes by meteors and space debris and stuff like that, we assume that, that, that it's a rare occurrence. Therefore, we can assume what's called a Poissonian probability distribution. This is the probability x in a given time times the, the, times the fluence, times the area, times the, the probability distribution, the Poissonian probability distribution, that you will get a failure. So this is the probability of failure. Now we're gonna pull a fast one on you. We're going to state that uh, we're gonna calculate what the probability of no impact is because it's gonna be fairly long between impacts. So we set X equal to zero, put X to zero here, put X to zero here, whoops. And you get, you'll get the following equation. The probability of no, no impact in a given interval is equal to after you do the, put X in, e to the minus f, 
That's the, the critical fluence times the area. Now remember, fluence is particles per unit area and times the, oops, sorry, I keep doing that area. And if you expand that, since this is a small number, you get one minus the fluence times the area. And then we assume one or more, if we now invert that and assume what's the probability of one or more impacts, uh, X equals one, two, three or something, we find that probability of X being greater than zero is one minus the probability of no impacts equals the fluence times the area. This is an intrinsically obvious equation, but this is how we derive that. And I wanted to show you the mathematics of getting there. So the probability of getting hit by a meteoroid or space debris is proportional to the critical fluence times the area that you're worried about. And then you sum that over all the time intervals of your mission and things like that. And you, and you get the total probability of, of impacts greater than zero affecting your system. So that's the bottom line. And that's what we calculate. And I'm going to show you some calculations along those lines. For example, here's the cal that calculation carried out for uh, missions to the, mission to the sun, a mission at 1AU, and a mission to uh, Cassini mission to Saturn. And here are the types of programs that are available from JSC and um, from uh, Marshall if, if you desire them. Uh, Ordum is the orbital debris engineering model for predicting orbital debris impacts. Legend is the model for predicting future orbital debris environment scenarios. That's where we pre they predict using Kessler's formulas, they predict how many pieces are going to be there and, how, and for certain launch rates and stuff for the future. Then this is the model for object reentry risk analysis. Um, you have to figure out what the probability you're going to re-enter, given that the atmosphere of the Earth is the main drag source, or or you have to have fuel to make yourself re-enter. And this is you have to do nowadays for NASA missions, at least in the believe mil, all military missions, and they're trying to impose this worldwide through the UN. Uh, they would like people to provide an assessment report and end mission plans to show how you're going to get rid of your space debris or uh, get rid of your spacecraft so that it won't produce debris. Then down here is the uh, ESA version of these programs. And then meta, go down here. MEDEM is JPL's meteoroid engineering model. We're good for 0.3 to 10 AU. Currently, as far as I know, NASA's in, Mar, in model is primarily from 1 AU out to Mars. And I, th I think they've, they're in the process or have, have expanded. I haven't seen the, the latest results other than 2020. But now let's go over here and show you how these models would predict something. For example, there are three cases that you usually fly a space vehicle. Either fly uh, the sensitive surface in the direction you're going or rearward, or you, have the, you allow the thing to tumble sort of random. Now, if you're going in towards the sun, uh, what you see is that stuff catches that stuff catching up is catching up with you from behind. Things are falling into the sun. So most of your impacts are going to be on your rear. The random is somewhere in between, and the front surface isn't going to see that much, interestingly. At 1 AU, you're going to it's going to you be more randomly tumbling, it's going to see everything because you've got stuff falling into the sun and you got stuff uh coming out from the sun. And, but the, most of the stuff's gonna be either in orbit, is gonna be in orbit with you. So you, a randomly tumbling surface will see the most uh, fluence. Over here, the opposite is you go out towards Saturn. Uh, initially, we went into Venus, so you got the same effect as you had over here. But going out, most of the stuff you're going to see is coming at you because it's falling into the sun. And then you have your random, and then you have your tail. So obviously there are, two, there are different strategies that you can fly. Uh, if your sensitive surface is on your nose, then what you wanna do is if you're going into the sun, you wanna fly that surface forward. On the other hand, if you're going outwards from the sun, you wanna put for Cassini, for example, we flew it with sensitive surfaces like the rocket motor pointing back towards the sun. And then, uh, for Earth orbit, obviously, uh, you're going to just your your hose. You're getting stuff from every direction. So, but that's basically there are different strategies for shielding your your surfaces. Same thing is done for the space station. 
And this gives you, uh, using the Ordem uh, model, you can see how they've, for different regions on the ISS, they've calculated the probabilities of impacts. It's shown here in red, green, things like that, uh, the probability of getting hit and such like that. And so they obviously, they don't worry too much about a strut being hit, but they might worry about a crew module down here. So they're gonna put extra, they're gonna put Whipple shields there. They're not gonna put them up here, things like that. And so basically, depending on how you fly the ISS, you can see over here, this is the number of impacts, velocity and impact angle and stuff. The Ordem will allow you to calculate for each module, each strut, what the likelihood of being impacted us are. And then you have to factor into that whether it's, a, it's something critical, for example, critical circuitry, solar arrays, or whether it's personnel. Uh, clearly personnel, number one priority, solar arrays are the next thing. And then after that, struts and stuff like that. Um, I won't mention the big uh, elephant in the room, an astronaut on EVA. Anyway, uh, that has always been a very real concern. Uh, and if you notice, they try to do as little EVAs as possible because they eventually some astronaut will be impacted. And that's one of the big concerns. Now let's look briefly at mitigation procedures and documents and we'll be wrapping up here in about two or three minutes. These are the basic documents currently on, uh, in use uh, they, and they're updated versions. You can see down here the 2017, 2019. This is the management instructions for limiting orbital debris. These are the guidelines for limiting orbital debris down here. And these are the mitigation policies. And these are the specific mission requirements. It's an example of requirements. Disposal for space structures in or passing through LEO. If you're going to be inside 2,000 kilometers, then you have to get rid of your uh, spacecraft by one of the following three means. One, put it in lower altitude so that it re-enters within 25 years of completion of the mission. Or you have to move it into a controlled deorbit trajectory as soon as practical after mission. Finally, you have storage orbit options. You need to, you can maneuver the spacecraft up to above 2,000 kilometer and uh, I'll show you the reasons just a second for a minimum of 100 years. Or you can go up and you can grab the thing. Now I've been working, I worked with some uh, recently with um, uh, 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 Grumman, Northrop Grumman, and we worked on uh, going up and actually retrieving or putting extra fuel on the uh, spacecraft. They have a new system that they've been touting that uh, we helped them design. So here's the actual, what it looks like. This is the initial debris uh, or orbit uh, altitude for perigee of your space vehicle. And this is the apogee. And this is the number, this is the, uh, for a standard area to mass ratio of that. These are the orbital lifetime in years. You can see that orbital lifetime around 500, uh, circular orbit around 500 kilometers about a year. Three years, ten. you get up to 10 years up here. And as you go to higher and higher apogees, the, um, uh, the, the time lives. And then basically above 2000 kilometers, you can see that you're up there for a thousand, uh, you know, thousand years or more. This is, these are the actual disposal and storage orbits that you can put things in. This is geo orbit, I hear super geo. You have to get it out of geo orbit anyway and for geo satellites. So they're gonna run into each other. You can see down here at low orbits, you have to get above 2000 kilometers and put it here. By far, most LEO orbits achieve disposal by simply by re-entry. Very few go to 2,000 kilometer orbit because then you're, you're wasting fuel that you, you could use last longer. So to conclude, these are some of the classic space environment texts. Uh, this is the original uh, paper by Kessler on the collision frequency, uh, the Kessler syndrome. Uh, these are some of the early books on, on the subject. They are still all very valid. Down here, these are some of the meteoroid and papers and such of that nature. And down here's our meta model is down here. And you can see Don's uh, papers and things like this. These are older papers, uh, that you, but they're all still very re relevant. That's it. I guess I can throw it open to, uh, I can throw it open to questions now.
Yeah, this is a wonderful, amazing uh, presentation. Uh, so I think we got, uh, I immediately got uh, uh, Dave raise hand. So Dave, go ahead. I guess welcome to speak out. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite okay. clearly. <laughs> okay, hey, great presentation, uh, Henry. I was taking lots of notes. Uh, this is kind of related to your pitch, uh, but uh, you know, going back to the um, uh, uh, geosync super orbit disposal. Uh, yes. I've never heard anyone state that even if everybody were following the rules and near end of life at geo uh, boosting up a couple hundred kilometers uh, and then washing their hands and, uh, and going away, uh, what's to prevent uh, that disposal orbit from becoming a debris source as all those dead satellites start banging into each other eventually. Well, I mean, well, presumably, you have to remember, presumably they're all in roughly the same orbit. And right. so, so they're not coming, they're not approaching uh, each other very, very rapidly. And you think of it as a toroid in that region. And basically, if you remember the way that the debris hits you, it comes at, at just angles. No, there's not much coming from the front and there's not much coming from the back. And the only, th the problem you would have is if they have uh, different inclinations. And, but most of the ones out there are specifically in a geo inclination, zero degrees basically. And so my, my argument would be that uh, there's minimum opportunity currently. Uh, obviously, as you build up to thousands and thousands of satellites, you're quite right, that would happen. My biggest fear is that someone puts something going the other way. You can take a pan can of paint and shoot it going the other way in geo and take everything out. So you're kind of, uh, is you're almost implying there's a way to weaponize uh, that geo uh, disposal orbit if someone really wanted to uh, be a pain. Well, I did work for BMDO. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, okay, might I, add, I might add that the Chinese have already been a pain. Uh, <laughs> they, they did that pretty deliberately and they showed what they could do. And if, it, if that wasn't a warning shot, I don't think anything else can be. Well, I, first of all, I want to say thank you <clears throat> for your generation of experience. It's, it's awesome to have. Awesome to hear, by the way. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and also, one other thing, if you can do us a favor or me, is share that reference page again, or maybe have uh, one of our team members send it out. Uh, uh, just, I believe Ken has the hard copy. Ken, if you could send that out, or maybe I have it already in our email chain. You probably do, you do. Uh, plus, it'll. I think you, you're filming it, so it'll be online. But you can write me. Uh, I think if I remember, I put my email yeah. In, yeah, at the beginning, just email me and I'll send you it. Absolutely. You're brilliant. And, and last, lastly, are there any chance of, you know, these weird inclinations, polar orbits kind of seem to me like they're getting in the way and occasional crosses here and there. I, I don't know if you're seeing that or hearing that. Yeah, no, it is. I'll tell you the funny thing about it is, do you realize there's nobody that goes exactly at 90 degrees? So yeah. there's a little cone at north and south at 90 degrees where there's nothing. It's, <laughs> cone of, it's the cone of safety. I, yeah. <laughs> you can do, you can fly there with a solar sail. That's one of my other talks. I've done a lot on solar sails. You can actually hover <laughs> in that cone of safety. And you're totally safe. <laughs> Not a lot to see. Wow. But no, that's a that's a that's a problem. It's the inclination. That's why you saw the stuff coming in from the sides and everything. Yeah, yeah, I did see that. And thank you again. You're uh, it's brilliant to have you on the team. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Colonel, uh, uh, Colonel Shortes, go ahead. Uh, see, am I? Yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, Dr. Garrett, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> it, it, it covered the whole spectrum. It, it made things more complex in my mind, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it complex. People, people are still, you know, they've got it in hand, and I know that folks like you are the people we need to go to. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly appreciated. I had to, dis <laughs> both Galileo and Cassini, 
they had to they had to fly, fly a bit um, Cassini at least they had to fly a baby buggy bumper that covered the rear engine. I did the calculations for the meteoroids uh, impacting the uh, rocket engine. It turns out a three mil pit in uh, the in something like the shuttle engines or in the Cassini engines will fail it. Wow. Oh. Uh, the question I have is, <laughs> I like is, re is regarding uh, different using different materials as kind of bumpers yeah. uh, at a standoff distance away from uh, you know your critical item. Let's say it's a, a, a coolant tubing of some sort uh, that you don't want to get perforated. Um, it's my understanding that there's been some um, insight into uh, different materials as well as fibrous materials. For example, astral quartz in a mesh uh, that can provide a measure of protection by gaining a, a spray of small particles from the initial hit uh, such that it reduces the thickness necessary on the critical item. No, can you correct. comment on that? Yes, you're correct. And that's what they do. They have um, uh, Kevlar, things like that, that they use on the space station, if I remember. And they, they have a complex shield, uh, outer shield that they use on space station. Um, I should add, though, that pretty much like radiation, it's mass, mass, mass uh, to stop things. The, uh, the critical issue is, again, is geometry also, as you say, you can, you can design the shield. Uh, so I think I'm trying to remember what the spacing is. But I think it's almost a meter we on, on ISS, and we used uh, about uh, ten centimeters on Galileo, and if I remember on and Cassini, uh, to try to sh to do the shielding. So we have complex computer codes, like almost identical to the radiation codes that calculate the shielding. Uh, and spacing of the materials, and you put all that in. It, think of it like radiation shielding. You can, you can do the same with radiation shielding by using different materials to stop protons versus electrons and things of that nature. Um, I have another course on that. <laughs> and, and second, are, are there any, that's passive uh, shielding protection to mitigate the ultimate Correct, yes. uh, flux. Are there any active uh, shielding um, yes, I, I, well, I alluded to the orientation. And for example, the Air Force uh, when w was very worried about the Leonids. And so they actually closed down, so, closed some of the solar arrays and they oriented the spacecraft differently. We did the same thing at Mars when the comet recently went by. And uh, you can do things, if, if you can afford to maneuver, that's the, of course the third way to do it. And uh, try to avoid streams, try, there are streams around the earth. Like I said, the Russians have uh, created little beltways of uh, radioactive debris that, uh, that are mapped. And so those are the most, the most active way I know of uh, is basically just the move, if you know it. Other than that, there's no, there's no laser beams that you can shoot out yet. Maybe someday we'll have that, uh, have uh, uh, shields that we can use. I, I propose some, but, uh, Basically, uh, not, not yet. The, the velocities are too high to to really do much for the in between particles. It's it's a one gram to ten to fifteen grams that's going to get you. There's a lot of that, and uh, it uh, it'll just go right through you. Thank you very much. Uh, RP, go ahead. RP. Hey Ken, how are you? Uh, Mike and I are here. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Garrett, for sharing your vast knowledge and experience about this subject. It's probably the best Halloween uh, candy for every engineer that was um, following, especially engineers like me or sub engineers. It was amazing, very clear, um, and um, insight into the couple of, uh, subject. Um, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on, on um, I understand uh, that shielding is um, the thing to do, but have you uh, followed the European Space Agency and the Clear Space One? It's uh, I think it's a Swiss uh, startup uh, uh, company. Are you talking about trying to take stuff down? Yes, yes. With it's, harpoon, uh, yeah, with a harpoon and the... yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, it sounds uh, uh, science fiction to me, but 
Uh, what are your uh, thoughts? Well, on I've that? worked. I actually, I've worked on some of that. Like I said, with Northrop Grumman, uh, basically what what people are doing, what people have proposed and and have proven is that you can go up and you can rendezvous with a spacecraft, hook on a motor and either, and hook up power to it for that matter. And I, I presume in the future, more spacecraft are gonna have plugs that you can plug into and hooks that you can hook onto. Right now, it, it gets, it's very complex how you link up with them. But the uh, clear thing, they, they were using, a, they, they tested using a harpoon, if I remember, and they put a little spacecraft out there and uh, put, put a net and they tried and netted it. And so they tried several different techniques. The other thing you can do is you can put uh, tether on the thing. Uh, tethers, uh, I, I really like tethers. You can roll out a tether for about 10 to 20 kilometers and the electric field gives a V cross B uh, electric field in there and you put resistors and stuff like that and you lose energy real fast. It's, it's like uh, having a sail or something to increase your drag. You increase your drag and you fall down um, if, you, if it's done properly. And that's also been demonstrated. So there are several ways currently people have come up with to get the debris out of space. The problem is that the, most of them need large bodies and things like that. There's a, the range of particles ultimately they were gonna be really concerned about is from a few grams to 10 to 20 grams, I think, or to 20, 20 30 centimeters, uh, because those will destroy you. And there are a lot of it, like I said before. Mm. Uh, I think this cascading effect sounds uh, most worrying. Unfortunately, uh, the way I see it, and especially, um, the insights uh, into this subject is that we've polluted the space uh, as we've polluted the oceans with uh, plastic and um, microplastic. Oceans is way easier to deal with than space, as you know. Well, don't but, forget, yeah, yeah, don't forget, don't forget, they flushed the commode overboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got hit. By the way, they got hit and they proved that that's where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Dave, go ahead. You have another question? Yes, uh, Henry, the, uh, uh, I believe when you were uh, discussing uh, on the ground testing uh, that you limited your discussion, didn't you, to uh, pretty much uh, light gas gun testing below 10 well, kilometers? Well, I didn't mean to, I did, but... Uh, per second. But can you talk, can you discuss, uh, uh, you know, the situation with uh, above 10 kilometers? Like well, you, yeah, you, didn't mention the hyper you didn't mention uh, uh, you're not gonna like testing <laughs> or, or anything else. You're not going to like this. Uh, I have okay. worked on the JPL solar probe mission for many years. And it turns out that as you approach the sun, you get up to coll collision velocities in excess of 700 kilometers per second. You get up to uh, nuclear energies, basically. Jesus. And, and uh, <laughs> if you look at the sun, it turns out that they can photograph comets crashing into the sun and creating these large clouds of debris. <laughs> it's going 700 kilometers per second. <laughs> I mean, you can, they have movies of the comets coming in and just blowing up, you know, just coming apart. And so we were very concerned about that. And my job was to go and find out how you test at those velocities. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out you can. Um, there's something called a nuclear fusion. And if you remember the way fusion works is that they uh, use lasers and they hit the little particle simultaneously with 100 uh, laser beams and compact it. Well, about half the time they miss. And the little thing of whatever it is they got that they're uh, compacting goes weighing off at about 700, 800 kilometers per second and makes holes in the wall. <laughs> mm. So they, could, they actually offered to do that for us. <laughs> mm. So nuclear, the nuclear fusion is one way to do it. Uh, the other electrostatics, um, the problem with both of those techniques is that you are not clear on what the, what the state of the uh, projectile is because you're accelerating it so fast that it most likely is either gas or liquid rather than a solid, but there's no way to prove it if you follow me. Yeah, I guess uh, from a more practical standpoint, other than uh, sending a spacecraft to skirt the uh, coronasphere and, and all that stuff, uh, I'm still concerned that we don't have full up testing capability 
uh, for the 10 kilometer to 20 kilometer range, which would be what we really still need right now. No, we uh, do. What they typically what they try to do, as I understand it, is they'll take two uh, 10 kilometer guns and shoot them at each other, basically, which is very hard to do, as you can imagine, but you do enough shots, you can do it. And uh, that's one of the ways of doing it. Uh, I have thought I did visit, I think it was the University of Washington, and they showed me some of their new techniques with the gas guns. But the, and you can get up to higher than that. But again, the problem is that you're using guns and uh, you, you, you damage the electrostatic ones work great. And they have one up at Stanford now. I think they moved the one up to Stanford from, uh, Ger from Germany, uh, from Darmstadt, I believe is where it was. Um, the problem again is that you can only go up to a few uh, milligram, not even milligram particles. You're, you're, yeah. talking, you're talking nanogram particles, but those will go up to any velocity you want. As long as it's a metallic particle, you can put a charge on and excel. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the question is is again is the physics is the thing solid or a liquid or what what is it? But see, yes, you can get into that you can get into that velocity range. You cannot necessarily get into the mass range. You're interested. Right. Right. All right. Uh, on that hopeful note, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Terry, I saw your raised hand. Did you have another? Do we have another question? Oh, well, I, I mean, I always have questions, but I'm good. That was all answered. Thank you. Okay. Now we see uh, Mr. Albert Widows is here. <laughs> That's my closest friend. <laughs> Albert Widows is here. <laughs> He's, he's going to embarrass me. He will embarrass me. <laughs> this is not, we're friends. I don't know whether I should insult him or say that he has provided. I'll say the latter. He has a multitude of talks of this nature. One of the things he does is he gives us, as he did here, an overall visibility of the area that he's talking about. And there's theory, nice pictures, and the wealth or depth of your knowledge, Henry, always impresses the heck out of me because you come out of the wall with crazy ideas and you've been there, done that, or know who has. Well, thank you, Albert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, Dr. Garrett, you know, this uh, repertoire is very uh, uh, in, 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 impressive. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, people, you see, you know, you put this, uh, uh, you can quantize those things and put into physical laws and uh, make it more um, uh, like a physics space. That's, I think that's very important for the uh, future of the space mission. Uh, just a question, quick question. In, uh, a few days ago, we heard the news that uh, Blue Origin is going to build a, uh, the, 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 I think it's called a space park or, or uh, something, reef. a new space, space station. Reef. Space reef. Yeah. yeah, space reef. So how do you think, uh, the, 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 do, do they have, that for sure they have to take this into consideration. So, uh, do, do you think they will be careful enough to uh, design those kind of shielding? And uh, do they have to submit their pro proposal to somebody to get approved for, for that kind of thing? Well, that's the question. The uh, rules are changing. Uh, right now you're, in the US, you're supposed to do that. And in fact, SpaceX, of course, is what, 10,000 satellites in LEO? I think that's what the final count's going to be. I actually asked them at one of the one of the meetings with their with their vice president, the lady was what they were going to do, and they said, "Oh, it's all figured out. They're gonna, they'll they'll come in." <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. The bottom line is that um, you just go and you do it and you try and see what happens. Uh, it's possible to protect them from centimeter down, and that's the most likely thing to get hit with. Um, that that you can do without too much trouble, but uh, you're going to have to accept some kind of risk as these things grow and grow and grow. And um, Don was right. Uh, this this could go catastrophic once something hits something and something hits something else. And if you have people like the Chinese, uh, you know that that was a substantial enhancement in the debris belt from one test. And uh, if we ever go into any kind of uh, war fighting scenario, it, it could be all over. Yeah, you're right. You know, you, you showed us the, the huge jump 
by the Chinese. Uh, I think Colonel uh, Shortis has another question. Go ahead, Colonel. Yes, Dr. Garrett, uh, mm -hmm. with all these mega satellites uh, that are proposed, Starlink and, and whatnot, um, just the increase, increase numbers of as-built systems are going to just take off uh, from yeah. Leo probably out to uh, uh, geo. Well, you know, maybe beyond. But uh, the question I have is: Are the uh, the lessons learned, the best practices, the policies, the regulations, are they keeping pace, or do we need to kind of accelerate the action on on that side, on the programmatic and policy side? Otherwise, we may get into you know a uh, uh, a situation where they start kicking off and we can't control it. Well, I th unfortunately, uh, there is an international body handling this uh, through the UN, and they have they have two or three year missions um, meetings each year, and I think there's one coming up in a month or two. I, if uh, anybody's interested, I can send the information. Uh, Mark Matney's holding one down at JSC and all this stuff. But the bottom line is, uh, it takes one bad actor. We've had one bad actor, and I think uh, you're going to see more of that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's literally, I don't know how you control uh, rogue countries. And uh, I understand with SpaceX and their big constellations and stuff, they've got a financial gain, and uh, they're going to do what they're going to do. And they claim, like when I, for example, when I asked them publicly, they claim that they're going to follow all the rules, but already the astronomers, of which I'm a, a member of the community, uh, we're having problems with photography. You know that, that's it's gotten really bad just from the Starlink. And I don't know what to tell you people. It's uh, you pollute, you, climate, it's the same as climate change. Let's just view it as a form of climate change. And you know how well that's going. Uh, would, uh, would discussions on a treaty, uh, and, and that's not to say that, you know, if, if war breaks out in space, then yeah, everything is off. But uh, it makes, uh, you know, the powers to be uh, geopolitically accountable to other Countries. Yeah, and, and there is, as like I said, there is a tr there is this there is an international body that's handling all this. Uh, I don't remember the name right now, but I know that it's the, that it's through the UN, and we have our representatives on that. I know that JPL we're required to file uh, basically a flight report for every mission. Everything we fly has to have a uh, description of the probability of leaving garbage behind and uh, what our plans for disposing of everything is. Uh, and that's, that's in the US environment. But even there, like I said, there are people launching tens of thousands of satellites and uh, that can't be good. Thanks. Is that it, you, you, oh, you and yeah, orbital debris, whatever, yeah, okay. Yeah, so Edward, uh, Mr. Keith, do you want to say something? Well, he typed up. Yeah, he typed up. Okay, <clears throat> he says good. All right. Uh, anybody with any question, welcome to raise your hand. Oh, Terry, do you want to? Oh, you spelled it out. Okay. Yeah, it's <clears throat> they're working hard at it. You know, they're they were at the Hague a couple of weeks ago. Mike, I forget Mike's last name. You probably know him, uh, Doc. He's he's kind of been the, uh, the politician for us there at the UN. And, you know, hopefully they come to you know with some agreement. The the Chinese fellow who runs the Chinese Space Agency has written a kind of a anti Artemis Accords letter. <laughs> That uh, you know, if you want to call it that, exactly. Uh, so we'll we'll see. I, I think the bad actors, you know, are are going to be the problem. We're not going to be able to control them. 
I know, and that's that's basically my argument. And I, I worry about the ten thousand satellites. No matter what anybody says, it's ten thousand satellites. Yeah, I had a great description of that in a, in a paper I wrote. I was like, imagine you just had a car with a flat tire on a major highway. You're going at seven kilometers a second, and you pull over. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of debris. Anyway, you're you're brilliant. Keep up the good work. Can't thank you enough. I hope I didn't get it too wrong. <laughs> By the way, the, the numbers part of it was fascinating. I appreciate the uh, physics side of that. So thank you. Okay, I have, there's a lot more in that. I have, I've collected all everybody's different equations. I have over 200 different equations. <laughs> for, those are, those geez. are worth, those are worth money, apparently. <laughs> Here you are. Um, so while waiting, uh, if any further question, I have a question about this uh, models you, you talk about. So there are several models, NASA, ESA, those kinds of things. Uh, so is it just somebody did a comparison or? Uh, yeah, that's what this international body does and stuff. And this conference is coming up that uh, I think Jay oh, okay. is hosting. That, that, that's, that they're gonna have a hundred papers or more. I mean, and as best I know. And uh, so they, they're constantly comparing and doing those things. I'm a little bit out of it now because uh, one of my colleagues uh, some year, about five or six years ago, took over uh, all the uh, current work at JPL. Uh, but <laughs> I see. So basically you are saying that uh, even though there's a requirement for uh, th th those company or organizations to submit their proposal for end of life, uh, for a satellite, but these are not enforced, or they are enforced that if they don't, you know, uh, for proposed, they, they won't be allowed to, to be launched? Well, let's put it this way. They, they quote unquote, uh, designed the uh, uh, SpaceX system so they wouldn't affect astronomers very much. They flew them and they affected it a whole hell of a lot. And so they designed another set and they set up that and it's better, but it's not there yet. And they're still launching. And so I, I see the meteor, the space debris thing, pretty much the same thing. They're going to do their best to try, but if it don't work, you know, what are we going to do? If they make a mistake, what do you do? Yeah, you you're, you're right. Yeah, you because can't. I heard, I saw some news. They are talking about that uh, uh, SpaceX want to have their own uh, smartphone using their own Starlink satellite yeah. constellation. And the Apple also want to do the same thing. Also mm -hmm. want to do so. They want to have their own fleet. And Amazon. And yeah, <laughs> <Google. goodness. laughs> exactly. Well, it's, yeah. People it, got to look into this. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that I didn't bring up uh, is uh, solid propellant rocket motors have all kinds of aluminum oxide particles in there. So one of the major pollutants that we don't really fully understand is the. Uh, uh, burned out debris from solid propellant motors. The liquid is, is a different kind of pollution, but the, and it's a problem too, but the uh, solid particles from the, uh, the retardant that they use in the solid propellant rock is probably the biggest source of debris. Yeah, I can be honest on that, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> but that's, that's what I, I've been told. Uh, I think recently the news, I, I think they, uh, I think it's uh, either the uh, some agency or some high-ranking general or something declare the state space debris as official threat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the news. Yeah. But, it's official now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what they're gonna do, but uh, no, it's uh, it's a problem. How do you get? Uh, like I say, I've I've worked with some of the groups trying to bring this stuff down and uh, things of that nature, but. I th think you're just going to have to make people toe the line, and it's like climate change. How do you how do you do it? Yeah, that's a very good point. You mentioned about this climate change. Yeah, it's an analogy. Uh, Kevin, Mr. Gilbert, go ahead. Sir, I was just uh, based on this this discussion. I was just interested if um, you had any thoughts on the um, SpaceX has talked about an autonomous, self-directing collision avoidance system. Well, that takes, care, that takes care of their satellites, <laughs> as long as it works. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that's for my question. Yeah, for autonomous system, you have to have fuel. And uh, one of the 
that, that that's the thing. It would be really nice if they could use the fuel to absorb it. But uh, what do you think, given the choice, uh, extra two years on orbit or deorbit? Uh, at, at the end of the day, what do you think they'll make? Depends on how much money they've got coming in. <laughs> and whether they're still in business. I mean, look, somebody launches 10,000 satellites and goes out of business. What do you do? That was uh, Iridium, if you remember. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the Iridium flashes. They're, they're really impressive if you've seen the Iridium flash. That was a side benefit. <laughs> That's where the real bright flash and it blind it can almost blind you. I mean look at I look at the telescope when it happened. <laughs> thank you. I see yeah, thank you. I think Dave raised hand again. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, you haven't cut me off yet, and I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, but since you mentioned it, uh, you know, you mentioned you mentioned Henry that uh, one of the things you're most concerned about is the one gram to twenty gram uh, approximately area, uh, uh, both because, as you showed with your dramatic picture, that can do, literally destroy things, and at the same time, there's a lot of it. That's from right. a mitigation standpoint. Uh, in the back of your mind, is there a favored candidate or two in terms of a mitigation collection, you know, a trash collection technology for the one gram to 20 gram? Not, uh, not at, I can't, I don't see anything myself at this time because the problem is that you have to fly, you have to fly up to it, you have to collect it, and then you have to have a vehicle that's not going to blow up in the process and not going to add more space debris trying to collect all the other space debris. You, you gotta have a you know thousand to one ratio between your vehicle uh, blowing up and being able to retrieve all that debris. And remember, remember, it has to rendezvous with this stuff. It has to find it. And uh, it's in the size range, it's very difficult to find. I mean, I, I've seen methods for doing that where you took two lasers out in front and try to radar it, they LIDAR it and stuff like that. but. At this point, the only thing, the thing I can see is don't create it. And I don't see how you can avoid that. I mean, we did the best we could on our Titan II and uh, trying to vent it, and, uh, but it still blew up. And because hmm. the heat, you know, eventually the fuel expands and blows the damn things up. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Ed, Ed, Edward, uh, Mr. Keep posted something. I think it's a, a news. Uh, do you want to say something about it or other question? Oh, he says he's it's, it's just trying to help. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, folks, this is a great opportunity. So, if you have any question, please click raise hand to speak out. Yeah, Dr. Gary is actually an uh, expert in those uh, space environment, not just space debris, but uh, thinking about this, uh, you know, space debris is really kind of most uh, present danger. Um, but we'll, we'll have uh, invite uh, Dr. Gary back for more space environment talks. Uh, but, you know, this is space debris seems to become, um, you know, more and more uh, priority and uh, people are very interested about it. Uh, I would some, add that. Uh... As uh, Ken knows, I have a the, uh, Na NASA Goddard recorded uh, one of my presentations about an hour, two hour talk on all the different environments and things. And they put it up on YouTube uh, the, for me. Yeah, we'll, we'll post the link if you permit yeah. us. Yeah, we'll post the link, yes. Please do because, and if anybody's interested in any of the, spe the specific topics, I, t I used to teach a two day course in the Air Force and uh, NASA and at JPL uh, three or four times a year on all these subtopics. And I've got several books um, on, on it out there. The, um, my, my main book on the space environments overall is with Daniel Hastings at MIT. It's, it's their, the course that they teach there based on uh, his and my book. And then uh, with Whittlesey, uh, we've got all the spacecraft charging stuff that, that he and I do. And 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. space uh, space car charging also very important topic. Yeah, we will also post those uh, books, you know, the links. Uh, uh, you know, after the event, we generally post the video recording, podcasts, and further info. We'll post those on those website uh, website, and uh, we'll send the email to uh, to the attendees, so people yeah. can. Uh, yeah, if you send send that Goddard uh, one, the only problem with it is that they they do some business up front for the first ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 I understand. We, we can put a note that uh, your talk start from a uh, certain minute, 10 minutes or so into it, then to the video. Okay, so anyone has any more questions? I have tons of questions, but you know, we, we don't want to uh, keep Dr. Garrett with us all, the, all day long. Uh, we'll invite him back for further exciting uh, talks. Uh, so if we have any question, do it, uh, ask it right now. Um, you can write me. I mean, it's, okay. it's, just have them send it to me at the henry.d.garrett at uh, jpl.nasa.gov. Okay, I will post. I will post that email address as well. Excellent. So, uh, all right. So, since there are no more questions, and I don't want to uh, dump all my tons of questions, so um, so let's thank uh, Dr. Garrett for today's uh, wonderful, distinguished, you know, amazing uh, lecture. This is just uh, wonderful. So really appreciate uh, Dr. Gary. Really appreciate your uh, lecture today. It's wonderful. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your uh, attending. You are attending this uh, great lecture today. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll uh, have Dr. Gary back uh, uh, in a couple months and uh, uh, for more exciting talks. And uh, please, you know, uh, look forward to our next event. Uh, November 1st is the Gary Powers event that's in Las Vegas. Uh, the next webinar is uh, next Saturday, the Space War. Uh, so uh, on, on, on June. So look forward to seeing you again. So have a great Saturday. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, kill it.